In this video, we're going to take a tour of all of RailClone's operators in less than 15 minutes so that you can start experimenting with these powerful nodes right away. To make it easy to understand the function of each operator, we'll use a basic graph with simple alphanumeric source geometry. In the next video, we'll take all this theory and apply it to a real style. So let's start with a simple one. The randomized operator does exactly what you'd imagine. It randomly selects a segment from the available inputs. You do have options to control the probability though. Simply edit the percentages to control the likelihood of an input being selected. These values are normalized, so there's no need to ensure that they add up to 100%. Next up, we have the sequence operator, which is invaluable for creating repeating patterns. It simply starts assigning segments from the top of the list and works downwards. Each segment can be repeated using a counter. When the counter reaches its limit, RailClone moves on to the next item in the list, and when the sequence reaches the end of the list, it just starts again from the beginning. The sequence counter can be reset either at the start of each spline or the start of a new section. You can combine the sequence counter with the randomized node to create some interesting effects. For example, I could alternate between randomly selected numbers and randomly selected letters by wiring them to this kind of graph. The sequence counter can also be used on 2D arrays to create patterns on the Y axis. All you need to do is change the mode to increment on Y. Another operator for picking geometry is the selector operator. It's used to choose from a list of segments using a numeric index or an attribute of the graph or markers. As a simple switch, it can be helpful for creating easy to edit styles. Just wire your segments to the selector operator's inputs. The order is important though, because the index numbering is built from the top of the list, with an origin of one, and increasing downwards. If you need to change the order, use the up and down arrows that appear when you select a segment. It can be really useful to export this index parameter to make changes without opening the style editor. To do that, you'd right click on the selector node and choose export index. You then create a new numeric node and wire it to the index input. You can now control the selection from the parameters rollout without opening the style editor. Another option is to use the constant node. Now these work in the same way, but the number is only accessible from the graph. It can be useful for synchronizing the same value between multiple nodes. Another really handy tip that I recommend learning early on is to use a random number node with this exported index parameter. Using this, you have a lot more control over when a new random number is generated compared to the random operator. To use it, you'd wire a random number node to this index property. Leave the type at integer and set the range to match the number of inputs on the selector operator. So in this case, I'll have one to four. You can now control when a new random number is created using the generate on mode. Choices are start, which generates a new random number once for each instance of the rail clone object, segment, which generates a new random number for each individual segment. X spline start, which generates a new random number for each sub spline found in the X spline input of the generator. X spline section, which generates a new random number for each spline segment. For the purpose of this calculation, a segment is the section of a spline between two corners or in evenly segments or the start and the end. Array Y row generates a random number at the start of each new row. This only of course works in conjunction with 2D arrays. And then generator, which I'm not demonstrating here, creates a new random number per generator. It's particularly useful for advanced techniques like nesting arrays. You can also use a material ID assigned to the spline to change the geometry. And to do that, you change the mode to X spline material ID and then go to the base spline's section sub object level and then select the section you wish to change and go to the surface properties rollout. Enter a new material ID in the set ID field. Like so. There's also an option to change segments based on the material ID assigned to the next spline section. If you're using 2D arrays, you have the same options to do the same thing for the Y spline too. Another alternative to using the spline itself is to use markers. And to use these, you change the selector nodes mode to X spline marker ID, 
then select the spline and add a rail clone spline modifier. Then click to add a few markers. You can now control the geometry using the markers user data ID value. This also works for Y splines on A2S arrays. The next operator that can be used to select segments is the conditional node. It's used to choose between two inputs based on the result of certain tests. To use it, you'd wire your two options to the true and false inputs. Your conditional tests can then just be enabled as follows. So spline checks if the length of an underlying spline is greater than or less than a specified value. The condition can be checked over the full length of the spline or only for the current section, which as I mentioned before is defined as a section between two segments of the type start, end, corner or evenly. Position checks if the position of the segment along the spline is greater or less than a certain percentage value. Here, if setting it to 50% means that we swap halfway through the spline's length. And this can also be measured as a percentage of the full path, as we can see here, or from each individual spline section. Type checks to see if the current spline segment is either a line or a curve. To change the type, you'd need to click on the spline, select a section, and right click to change the type. For most max spline objects, the default is a curve, irrespective of the type of vertex you create. Material ID checks the current path's material ID to see if it's equal to or not or greater than or less than the multiple of a specified value. It's a really handy way to quickly swap geometry using attributes assigned directly to the base spline. Segment counts the number of pieces of geometry placed on the path before the current position. It returns true or false if the values entered in this node meet certain conditions like equal, not equal, greater than, less than or a multiple of the set value. Finally we have vertex. The angle condition checks the angle formed by the spline at the corner. There are two modes here. When enable wide angle is enabled, it tests the spline according to a full 360 degree rotation. This can be useful for detecting internal or external corners for example. However, when this option is disabled, the angle is measured at each corner from both sides up to 180 degrees, which will treat internal and external corners in the same way. There's also a type option, which will check whether the vertices are a certain type, either corner, bezier, bezier corner, or smooth. With all these options, you can have multiple tests simply by enabling several checkboxes, in which case they use an OR logic. So for example, a segment count with a multiple of two on the X or the Y axis would give you this kind of result. Moving on, the transform node replicates many of the parameters found in a segment node. But because it can be placed in the graph anywhere, after a sequence for example or a randomize operator, it's a useful way to be able to make changes to several segments at once. It can also be useful where you wish to reuse a segment multiple times, but each one with different properties. It's also necessary to use the transform operator when dynamically controlling a segment's properties using arithmetic expressions, but we'll talk more about that another time. To illustrate the transform node, we'll bring back our random operator and then wire a transform node after it. Now you can adjust the padding to control the distance between adjacent segments with separate controls for left, right, top and bottom. You can scale it using a fixed size. If scale mode is disabled, the values are only used for calculating the position of adjacent segments, but it doesn't affect the geometry itself. You can change the alignment used to calculate how the segment's positioned on the X, Y or the Z axis. If you choose pivot mode, you can also enter a pivot offset. You can override the segments to form modes by enabling or disabling bend and slice. You can force instancing and you can override any banking angles introduced by the generator's X rotation property or using a rail clone spline modifier. Onto the next tab, you can add a fixed rotation, translation or scale value. And below that, you can add a random rotation, translation or scale value. So this transform node can also be used to generate an empty segment where no input is connected and fixed size is enabled. You can see we're using this technique in our graph to add a null segment to the corners. Moving on, we're going to look at the mirror operator, which really doesn't need a lot of explanation. It simply allows you to flip geometry on the X, Y or the Z axis.
One that perhaps does need a bit more explanation though is the Compose operator. The Compose node allows you to group together existing segments and then RailClan will treat them as a single object. It's kind of like grouping. It can be used to force several segments to be treated as one object and allows you to add multiple segments to inputs that would normally only display a single object and I'm thinking here like corners, start, end and evenly. To use it, you'd wire the segments to the input slots of the Compose node and then wire it to the generator. In this example, I'm going to go for the start and end inputs. You can see that the geometry is kind of placed one after another, similar to a miniature linear array or sequence operator. You can then easily adjust the order using the up and down arrows that appear when you select a segment name on the Compose node. An important thing to be aware of is how Compose nodes are aligned on corners. You'll get different behaviour depending on whether you have an odd or an even number of segments attached. When using an even number of segments in the Compose operator, RailClone centres the Compose geometry to the segment immediately before the corner. This means that using an even number of segments always creates an asymmetric corner composition. On the other hand, when an odd number of segments is used, the middle segment is always centred to the corner which means that using an odd number of segments also always creates a symmetrical corner composition. So if you only want two segments to appear, say for example one on each side of the corner, you can cheat this rule by creating an even number of inputs by adding a new empty or null segment to the center of the compose node as you can see here. Now so far we've only discussed the compose operator sequence mode. The operator in fact has a second mode called grouped that assembles all of the connected segments using their original pivot points. For example, our number and letters all share the same pivot, so in this mode they'll maintain their exact same spatial relationship, irrespective of the order they're wired to the node. Closely connected to this, the reverse operator only works with composed nodes that are using sequence mode. It reverses the order of elements. For example, here we'll change our Compose node back to Sequence and then wire a Reverse operator to the End input. As you can see, the order is reversed. You also have the option to mirror segments on X, which as the name suggests creates a mirror copy of all the segments on the X axis. This node is ideal for reusing start geometry in the End input. Our next two operators can be used to manipulate material IDs and UVWs. The material operator uses a designated material ID from the input segment and replaces it with a new value identified in the FROM2 range. If the FROM2 values are identical, the ID is simply swapped for a single value. Then the operator can either replace the IDs in a looping sequence or it can pick values at random. And then the UVW operator allows you to manipulate the mapping coordinates already applied to a segment. There are two tabs and two modes available. Fixed mode allows you to adjust the tiling, offset and rotation of UVW coordinates and in this case all segments will have the same results. On the other hand, random mode allows you to randomise within a range the tiling, offset and rotation of UVWs to create unlimited variations. You also have the option of stepped increments for the randomization controls so that you can sample individual parts of a map and add rotations at regular intervals. And finally, bringing our video to a close, there's the arithmetic node, which simply can be used with any of the other numeric values for common mathematical functions like add, subtract, multiply, and more. There's also an expressions mode, but we'll get into that another time. And that's pretty much it. In this video, we went through all 11 of RailClone's available operators. Stay tuned for our next video, where we'll take this theory and combine it all together to improve our building style with some sequences, randomization, group geometry, and more.